everyone. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn again. Thank you for joining us. Today we have some very special guests, Gary and Judy Olson, and the session will be moderated by Maritza Campo, who is an assistant professor at UCI's Paul uh, Mirage School of Business. So without further ado, uh, we will begin. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. So take it away, Maritza. Thank you. Do you mind um, closing the screen, the shared screen, please? Sure. Thank you. That way we get bigger. That's right. And we can, and if um, those of you who I'm going to guess very few of you are unfamiliar with Zoom at this point in COVID-19, but if you'd like to click on gallery view, we can see everyone. It's like a big old Brady Bunch image. There we go. There we go. Okay. And um, part of what we're really going to talk about, obviously, with the internationally renowned experts on global collaboration and virtual collaboration is how to do it better. And so an aim of that is to even enact some best practices. And for those of you who have taught this quarter or maybe the tail end of last quarter, we end up blind and invisible to one another in our interaction. So if we can, if you wouldn't mind, assuming you're not in your pajamas, turning on your video so that Gary and Judy can um, pick up on your reactions and where they might have lost you, et cetera, et cetera, um, or where you're really excited and want to hear more. Okay, so I am guessing with an RSVP of 109 people that everyone was really excited to get to hear from Judy and Gary Olson. For those of the, you that don't know their careers, I think together we're probably talking close to 200 peer-reviewed articles on the subject of collaboration. Knowing them personally, I know that it is a calling to think about and to study and to support people working to help them work as effectively as they possibly could. Um, the, they have been fascinated with technology for a very, very long time and have thought about um, how we can work uh, more effectively when we're working across distance, across time zones, across culture, etc. And so, um, and, and obviously they are from your home school. So um, I'm gonna really, I'm gonna ask them a series of questions, right? Pick their brains, if you will, as all of us are doing Zooming all the time. Um, and please add any questions you have in the chat. If you are uncomfortable with chat, any kind of like exaggerated hand waving, like, wait, hold on, I have a follow up question, go for it. It's all good. Um, we just wanna make sure we connect what they know to what you need um, as effectively in the 30 minutes we have. Um, first of all, I hope that everybody is well, everybody has their groceries, everybody's parents and family are doing a-okay. I just wanna acknowledge that these are strange times. And, um, and we will be, we'll, we'll have a couple of questions for Gary and Judy about um, doing what they have done, studied for so long under these circumstances. All right, so um, it is a pleasure again to get to interview them. And um, the very first question um, that I would like to ask on behalf of the 58 and counting people on this Zoom call, Gary and Judy, is can you give us the secrets, right? What do you know about interacting optimally via, via video and technology um, from your decades of research? Ah, oh, great. Well, I'll start at the basics. That is that you've got to get good audio. So audio is primary over video because if there's a delay in the audio, people will step all over each other. If you delay 100 milliseconds at the end, then somebody will think it's their turn. And yet you then are talking because you didn't hear that pause. And then you're both talking at the same time. It goes back and forth. No, no, you, you. And then they both shut up and it's terrible. So the systems that, that uh, prioritize audio over video are much better for you. Um, Zoom is very good with audio and we've noticed a number of times if there's uh, network delays then they make the picture fuzzy and then they will actually stop the picture but not keep, keep the audio going so you can actually have a conversation. You want to add something? Well also it helps if the audio is full duplex <clears throat> um, because if, if uh, it's only a half duplex then if you try to interrupt verbally or, or uh, make a verbal you know, acknowledgement and so on, it, it isn't heard. And we've had a case <laughs> back in the old days of telephony where <laughs> we were talking to a colleague at the University of Colorado and he wouldn't shut up. 
and we had to leave. And we finally just had to hang up on him because it was half duplex and we couldn't, couldn't we break couldn't in interrupt him. to say goodbye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that full duplex is really important. Yeah. Also, that while you're talking, to be able to hear the other people go, uh-huh, uh-huh, at the same time is really reinforcing. Um, we also know that if you don't get that feedback or the video feedback, you'll talk too long. So, and there's good data on that one. And, uh, and again, if it's single duplex, then you can't interrupt or anything. So audio is primary over video. So seeing others' reactions, really important. Just like right now, if you were all now looking out the window, then we'd have to speed it up or just go for <laughs> I saw you do that. <laughs> see, I can see you do that. Yeah. I can see smiles on your faces if we say something funny. Um, so yeah. that feedback is really important. Right. Right. Well, I guess some specifics about, um, you know, dress in, in um, neutral colors. Um, not stripes. Not stripes. Or Actually, checks. if you do stripes, they uh, shimmer. Yeah. Because every little motion you make, it has to rewrite it as opposed to just fill in. The so you notice is, we normally wear very loud clothes. Yeah, most of our very, clothes are very We great. had to look for these today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, um, uh, we, we had a, a telemedicine meeting uh, last week with a, a doctor that was uh, talking with Judy. And he had a bright window behind him. He was the whole time, he was just a silhouette. We never saw his facial expression. And we even told him, yeah. could you shut the window behind you or you know, change the direction of your camera or something? And he just kept going on. Yeah. He so, wasn't used know, to doing that. It was think, his first time. Think of what's behind <laughs> you. Right. Um, let's see. Oh, the other is muting uh, if you're not going to be talking. Because um, if, you make, if, you're, if everybody's microphone is open and then you kick your desk or you tap on it like this, the camera's going to go to you, and you're not ready to say anything, right? Or if you're eating Doritos, the camera will go to you. <laughs> so that's why we mute, is to control where the camera's going to be looking if they're only looking at one thing. Uh, and also attend to what's in your background. A uh, number of you are using the Zoom backgrounds. It's really lovely what you put behind you. Yeah. We, have, we have just our books, which is there all the time. <laughs> but the important thing is if you're going to use that background, don't wear something that's in the color of that. So I had a, uh, we did a Zoom the other day with uh, some colleagues and in the background was the ocean and a beach and the guy was wearing a blue shirt. Well, his, his shoulder disappeared entirely <laughs> and then it came back when he moved. And so if you wear the same color as your background, you're going to get eaten up by it. So I see, I see a lot of good backgrounds here and good contrast. Excellent. But I, what I'm understanding from the two of you is you, that there's, it's very important to preserve cues that are happening during interaction. And I hear you saying, boy, if there's shade behind you and I can't see your face and you're my physician breaking some news to me, it <laughs> is difficult. And I hear you saying, if I'm visually distracted by your shoulder disappearing during your, us, our conversation, or even if there's small utterances that um, maybe a person with more subtle forms of communication wants to pause or question or doubt if you're doing some scientific research, you're saying find ways to get as close as you can to those to preserve, I guess, right? The highest quality of interaction possible. Right. I had a conference the other day too where everybody was a new Zoomer and uh, many people had their uh, laptops on the desk in front of them. Well, that makes the camera really low. And then what you're showing then is mainly your chin, which is often not the best part of each of us. Um, and uh, so I get them to actually take their laptops and put them on some books. So the camera is the same level, right? So you actually look like you're, you know, not looking down, not looking up, whatever. So that camera placement, you're all doing a really good job on that. So so you want to be experienced Zoomers. Huh? Yep, right, exactly. Good. Um, so on the call, right, are fantastic scientists, scholars, researchers from numerous fields, obviously a heavy representation from Bren. Um, and we, many of us are, you know, yes, used to email, yes, used to Zoom calls here and there, but we are going exclusively to collaboration from a distance. Can you tell us, uh, Gary and Judy, how to work 
productively as scholars um, and maybe in our day jobs, right? Some people on the call are alumnus from, the, from um, Bren. What do we do in meetings? What do we do in between meetings? What tips do you have? Great. Well, there are lots of things that about this, this way of working that are a challenge because it turns out when you're in the same space as people, you get all kinds of useful, important information for free just because you're in the same area. Like we're, if they're there. Yeah, like <laughs> are they there, are they busy, and so on. So it's, it's important with these kinds of ways of working to be more um, thoughtful about how you're going to interact. For example, if you're really working on a project of some kind over a period of time, um, whoever is in charge, if there is a person in charge, has to be more proactive about trying to find out what people are doing. Because there's a real problem with, you know, out of sight, out of mind. And you don't know what, what's up with, with the other people working on things and whether they're having a problem or not. So it really helps for a manager under those conditions to be checking in on kind of a regular basis. Um, and then that raises a, a, a thing that Judy feels strongly about, which is the establishing what she calls a communication covenant. Maybe you can tell us about sure. that. Sure. Communication covenant is an agreement right at the beginning. I see some people shaking their heads. Michael <laughs> doing that because he was a student in my class. Uh, <laughs> and he made a communication covenant. It's a document at the beginning that says, how are we going to do this? So are we going to do text? Are we going to do email to communicate with each other? Uh, and if so, what's our phone numbers? What are our emails? Just all in one place. And then it's also, we plan to be on time to these meetings, or if, if not, uh, be sure to let us know. Um, and then telling you about how a project is going to be, where it's going to be stored as you work on stuff, whether it's going to be in Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever. And because if you don't say those things and you haven't worked with everybody before, then it goes haywire. People get all confused, documents get lost, all that kind of stuff. Hey, Judy, um, so I'm noticing that we have PhD students that are now working one, two, three in the morning. We have working parents that are working 5 a.m., 4 p.m., and we're collaborating with one another. And it's even been my case that we had a working document and you go, wait a minute, we have a conflicted version. You did the, all this work and then I did all this work and you know, so you ran away from the computer and didn't close it. And <laughs> how do we avoid duplication of efforts? How do we synchronize a little more effectively? Well, again, if you can say in the communication covenant, how are you going to do that? Or how are you going to hand off documents or when it's, a, I, we had a case of writing a uh, paper with two other people uh, and we decided we we're going to use Google Docs. And that was great because we we're working with Google people. Um, and it got to be that uh, some of them would write directly, change the document, right? And that's okay, because I could do the look in the revision history to see who did what. Um, but then others would just put comments on it. Like, you know, this sentence is too long, and I want to go, well, shorten it for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Um, so we have to decide whether what our roles are, who's in control of the document, if anybody, and then what can people do? Can they change it? Do they have to comment? Is this read only? And you call me on the phone. There's all, but some of that is a uh, power distance between people. Well, also, uh, I mean, just things like uh, establishing uh, uh, conventions for the project about how you're going to name things and how you're going to keep track of versions. Yeah. And if you're going to have, you know, multiple documents, how are you going to coordinate all that? Uh, are you going to put them in labeled folders? What, you know, there's just a whole lot of details, which, can lead to, you know, endless thrashing if they're not look, looked after carefully. But Maritza mentioned some other thing, and one other thing that I've noticed recently that people are letting me know on email of what their work hours are. So um, I was being interviewed by somebody yesterday who, when she invited me, she said, I work from eight to noon and I have children all afternoon. And then she works again in the evening. So I wouldn't expect to do the interview in the afternoon. I mean, I look for morning times or evening times, and uh, if I sent her something and didn't hear until, you know, the next morning when I got up, I would think, well, she's not working at all. Well, she's working very hard and she sent it to me, you know, at midnight. Um, so understanding the other people's situation. We also had a funny case where um, we were having a long distance video conference with some people and it was, we were in California, some people were in London and some people were in Chicago. 
and the Chicago people kept being late. There was one person who finally came into the video conference and she was in hair curlers. And we went, what is going on? And then she finally stumbled over to the video conference and said, we're having a blizzard, right? So the fact that we didn't know what the situation was in all these locations, um, just, you know, we made, came to the wrong conclusion. You know, I want to I want to ask a question about that blindness and you suggested that in the absence of seeing your coworker down the hall with an open door uh, walking, you know, around the halls at work, we make attributions. We say, "Oh, you're probably binging on Netflix or, you know, <laughs> you're not taking work seriously." Mm -hmm. um, what do you have as solutions for a manager, a principal investigator, a lab manager for managing that out of sight problem? and maybe even for the employee to manage up given the blindness that exists right now as we collaborate. Well, there, have been, there was a lot of work done actually going back into the 1980s and 1990s on the advantage of having uh, always on video. That uh, and so sometimes this was done like in, a, in a, 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 like a, a, an area where people might go frequently, like where they pick up their mail or where they would get their coffee or whatever. Now we're all in, in homes in, in this era, so it's a little different, but if there's some key people that you need to keep in touch with and you, you'd like to be able to have you know, spontaneous interactions, yeah. you, know, you could experiment with just having always on video. Yeah. And uh, one example, I, I was uh, associate dean for research when I was at Michigan and I had an administrative assistant who was you know, very critical to the work we were doing. Um, we initially had offices right next door to each other but then the whole school moved to a new building and she was on a different floor than me. So we had always on video and um, it was always on mute so that, you know, our conversations were private, but I could see if she was on the telephone, if she was had someone in her office, if she wasn't there at all and vice versa. And, you know, if something came up and I needed to check with her on something rather than having to walk up to the second floor and find her, I could just see that, oh, she's not there. I'll just wait until she comes back and so on. Uh, that kind of always on video these days with video being so good and relatively inexpensive or free um, that, that's a workable option now if you have a project of you know six or seven or eight people it's probably impractical to have always on video with all of them although you know uh, there's probably no reason why you couldn't um, but anyway there, there are things like that that can be ways of kind of keeping track of things that, that, that preserve some of the spontaneity that you have in a in a co-located setting but the other kinds of solutions are sharing your calendar. And yeah. no, you don't want to have pe other people know exactly what you're doing. You can set your calendar just to say busy or out of town or whatever. And so I can look and see when, when I'll get to you next uh, just to talk. But then also a lot of applications now for video, um, you look at your contact list and there's a green dot if they're on. So you could, again, in your communication covenant, agree to have like Skype on, not to actually use the Skype, but to have the little green buttons to see whether you're in or out. Right, and so something like Slack or Google Chat, yeah. or that's what you're saying, right? So other ways to stay connected, maybe text, e email, and then the calendar, I love that idea. So I, I want to ask, um, I want to ask you a question, right? So you have been studying this concept and this these dynamics for a long time, early first first to the party in many ways right and here we are within this crisis and everyone is working this way as visionaries having recognized the importance of this topic early tell us about how you see the future of work well i think we've learned a lot about what we can do to connect to other people and so we will be more mindful of that when we are actually at work and people are distant from us. Um, all the things you're learning now, you can actually apply to people who are just permanently long distance from you. Well, and distance is interesting. There was a, a well-known study done actually back in, I think, the 1970s. Um, <laughs> Some of you that, weren't born then. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, that showed that um, by, by distance, we mean, it, anybody who's farther away from you than 30 meters. So uh, you, it could be someone down at the other end of the hall that you're on or, or on, upstairs. The, up, on a different floor mm -hmm. or of course on a you know, university, they're in a different building. And those are all distant collaborations. 
And so some of the things we're learning now about how to interact with people that are across the country can be used, you know, to interact with people who are across the diag. Um, and so I think there's a lot more, there's more flexibility available with the kinds of things that we're, we're doing now. I mean, a good example of this is uh, using this kind of the, these kinds of tools for personal things. So we started our, our we have, we're a blended family. We have, we have, we have four children. They're all married. We have eight grandchildren. They're in four different time zones and in six different cities. Uh, uh, when you add in both my sisters and Judy's brother and so on. So every, every Saturday afternoon, we have a family hug. We all get together and just chat and catch up with each other. And we do it on, on Zoom and we can see everybody and chat with everybody and so on. It's just a way of keeping in touch. Now, when, you know, when we can travel, we'll be happy to go and, and play with our grandchildren and so on. But now we can play with our grandchildren online. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. In fact, we've even seen the grandchildren have learned how to play with each other while we're all chatting about other things. We'll see, <laughs> we'll see them holding up teddy bears and w the teddy bear waving at the other teddy bear and so on. So even the kids are learning how to do interesting things across distance in this era. Right? Yeah, I want to interrupt really quickly. So I love that you're getting at familial and relational connection. And I think even in our work, obviously, we create friendships and close yeah. relationships. And I love that. Um, but a question came through the chat, which um, it gets to this notion of innovation and creativity, which is sometimes we think of it as gen as uh, generating spontaneously, right? You're, you're at a conference and you're chatting and you go, oh, you're doing that, I do that. Or you're walking down the hall and you're connecting and some great ideas come that way, right? Mm -hmm. Can you connect and be creative? Can you, what do you think about, is there any replacement for that sort of in the office moment? Well, uh, you know, uh, for example, our department of informatics in, in the grand school has uh, weekly uh, coffee hours on Zoom. Um, they do it once, uh, I think it's on Tuesday mornings and on Thursday evenings, uh, so that those who have constraints during the daytime, like with childcare and so on, can do something, uh, can interact with their colleagues at night. And these are, there's no agenda, there's just, we get together, we chat about stuff, whatever's on your mind and so on. And, uh, you know, those kinds of kind of informal, you can, you can make occasions like that for informal things. We know about people who've had, uh, Zoom cocktail hours, mm -hmm. and uh, even Zoom meals together. We could have a lunch and learn on Zoom, right? <laughs> Before we begin here. <laughs> I saw yeah. that. Right. So yes, yeah, so you can have um, a hub where you pass by people and then stop and chat, just like you would at the coffee machine and, at work. And then you can say, well, let's work on that more, and then go to your <laughs> offices. If you're in the same building, you can co-locate. But if not, then you can just be at your desk. Everybody has stuff on their desk that's important to their thinking. Well, I, th I think, you know, what, that we often talk about these hybrid models where some people are co-located and others are coming in by technology. It reminds me, uh, we had a kind of a sad case a number of years ago, a, a, a fellow who'd gotten his PhD in informatics and we hired him as a postdoc to work with us on some projects. And suddenly he died, uh, very tragic. And it turns out most of us good friends were, had graduated and left Irvine and were all over the country. So we set up a kind of memorial service where there were about 10 of us in a conference room in Bren Hall, but there were about 10 people. That, I think we were using Google Hangouts at the time. There were about 10 people on Hangouts. So we could all talk and share our memories of this, uh, this fellow who died. And it was very, very important for the emotions of all of us who are his friends. And uh, the people who are not able to be present in Bren Hall were extremely happy that we reached out to them and allowed them to participate in this. So there are these kind of mixed modality things we can do when, when we uh, ha have a little bit of relaxation in these issues. I, I love what you're saying because you, I think a lot of us are going, okay, a Zoom meeting is for 30 minutes with an agenda and we get work done. Yeah. And you're really cracking open that definition and saying, you know yeah. what, connect emotionally, connect relationally, connect intellectually, and sometimes just connect to say, let's have a cup of tea, and then we'll get back to work or whatever it might be. Um, but I, I love that. There actually is research on this that shows that, um, you know, one of the things that is really important in a kind of social glue is how much people trust each other. And there's been a lot of work on trust. And, you know, Charles Handy wrote a book 
a number of years ago say trust takes touch. Now, you know, implying that you, if you're going to trust people, you have to have, you know, be in physical proximity with them. Well, we did a bunch of research some time ago that looked at various ways in which you might get around that. And it turns out there's, and Jim Herb's lab at Carnegie Mellon did some work as well, that um, these informal non-work-based interactions are where you establish trust with people. And so so we, we actually recommend that any meeting that goes from 12 to 1230 actually start at 10 to 12 and go on 10 minutes afterwards as if, you know, you're reminded by just seeing somebody, oh, I need to talk to you. Or beforehand, you know, you talk about the yeah. weather, you talk about sports. And that really helps the, the bonding. I had a uh, teleconference that was going on between France and the United States and Germany. And at the end of the meeting, uh, the United States just cut off immediately. And between France and Germany, they had a celebration of somebody who was retiring, and that was his last day. And, you know, for the Americans, um, time is money. And for the, the uh, Europeans, time was to keep the bonds. And so it was a big contrast there, that cultural difference. But keeping the, the video on 10 minutes before, 10 minutes afterwards can certainly help that trust building. Yeah, because the lesson here is that, that, that chat, chit chat about other things is actually very important. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here about um, sort of community connection and context, right? So we are, our lives and our, our personal lives and our workspace have melded together right now, right? And so some people like to say, I'm going to work and I dress like this and I talk like this and this is myself out there. And then there's myself at home. And now we're working with children in the background. Maybe our dishes aren't done. Maybe our, you know, whatever it might be and everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on the management of self mm -hmm. in connecting at this time? And I, I hope Idris, I'm giving that question the right spirit of <laughs> what you're asking. Can I add an additional flavor to that? Sure. Um, and the last part I'm curious about is that natural tension between um, inviting people to connect with you on that personal level. So how do you navigate the choice of I'm going to wear the dress shirt in this meeting, but maybe I'm going to let people see my messy room in this meeting as I've chosen to do today? <laughs> well, it's a difficult thing, uh, and I'm not sure we have a clear answer. I know that, um, that we keep this room sort of as our connection room. Every once in a while, when he's on a call and I have to be in the living room on my laptop, um, that feels weird. But, you know, <laughs> we sort of, we work during the day and then we relax in the evening. So uh, we sort of set, set aside some space. I think that's why the fake backgrounds for um, that number of you are using is because it hides what's behind you. Uh, it doesn't always hide the children because they, <laughs> they make noise. Or the pets. Yes. So <clears throat> I, it, it's a hard question, I don't know. Uh, I'll just step in for just about a minute. It's um, 1230, so we try to keep these lunch and learns content wise up to, you know, with the th first 30 minutes. Um, we're obviously now just gonna start addressing some of the Q&A that's in the format and then where so you can step in and just kind of ask your last closing thoughts. Um, there's also a question before um, Idris's one um, from Jonathan about how to engage students and how to help them with discovery. And well, if you can see that question. And Jonathan, if you want to step in and ask exactly kind of what you're. Well, I think that it's, a, it's a, a species of a general question, which is people at different points in their career trajectory or lifespan or whatever, maybe have somewhat different issues to deal with them in this, under these kind of circumstances. I mean, um, you know, I know uh, certainly when I was a graduate student, um, the, you know, the kind of social contacts of being with my fellow students and uh, being around faculty and so on on campus was really important. And now there's much more isolation that we're, you know, mostly at home, maybe by ourselves or with a, a roommate that uh, isn't part of what we do as in our work. And uh, I think there's some just some special challenges with kind of deal with this. We're, we're actually now living in a retirement community since we are emeritus. And about a third of the people here are singletons. 
And a lot of them are having a really tough time with this because they're all, all by themselves in their apartment. And I know that some of the staff here have been doing a lot of uh, reaching out to them by having one-on-one -on -one Zooms and stuff like that. Well, they, the people in marketing now who can't sell these places because we're in shutdown, um, call all the residents once a day. And they are particularly picking up on their tone of voice. Yeah. Um, and have some information to share, but just asking how you are. And, and there's one that said that if she heard the tone of voice that was not sort of sparkly, she'd offer to go take a walk with them. And many people have taken her up on that. So I think maybe for um, professor-student relationships that, you know, saying I'm going to check in with you every Monday, see how things are going, and be friendly about it, not just talk about work. Um, mm -hmm. I think that can help a lot of people who are just alone. Yeah. And then, so uh, Gary and Judy, what I'm understanding you saying now, what you're saying now is now speaking about roles and collaboration, which is to say maybe leadership and management had very, the lane was very clear about, oh, we're guiding a project. Mm -hmm. And now you're saying, look, people have loss and they're suffering yep. and they're struggling yep. and you're broadening again the definition of good manager, good leadership to say in your check-in, it's not only where are you on our work, but how are you? Right. Yes. Well, and a good concrete example is our youngest daughter and her husband live in New York City in Queens. And that's been the, the center of this pandemic. The worst infection is in New York City and the worst in New York City is in Queens. And they're quite frankly scared and you know uh, that's very different than our situation where we're in this place where we're being taken care of 24 7 by this amazing staff here and so on and so you know th there can be really huge differences in your circumstances under this in this kind of uh, situation so I, I think you're right be being, being sensitive to those kinds of differences is really 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 important good so there's a uh, somewhat contentious uh, debate that's happening um <laughs> right now on chat that I wasn't aware of. And this is again goes back to that notion of private and public space. We obviously know that workplace uh, harassment is an issue when we're face to face. Mm -hmm. But the question now becomes about online interaction. And, um, and so the uh, Dr. Pressman mentioned a graduate student who gets on a zoom call with a mentor, the mentor is in his bedroom. Right. And um, it's a very uncomfortable situation and it could be that that's the only quiet place his kids are running around mm -hmm. um do you have any thoughts on managing that gray line right with gender roles and sexual harassment and yeah, cameras and recordings etc cetera, etc cetera. well I, have, I think having being sensitive to how you are coming across to the others is really important and so the background uh, really matters the the bedroom there we know of a woman who cornered found a corner in the garage that is now her office I mean it, she's got a plywood uh, desk and she's got on uh, sawhorses and things like that because that's you know she didn't want people to see the paint cans and all the stuff that you know the bicycles and stuff and, but so she dresses goes to the garage and that's her work time Oh, another situation, there was a, a woman a doctoral student having her final d doctoral defense at the University of Michigan School of Information. And the only place she could find that was quiet was inside the closet in her bedroom. So she set up a lamp in there and closed the door and went in the closet for defending her thesis. <laughs> but so there are lots of unusual circumstances that come up in this situation. Yeah. Our research yeah. covered uh, the situations of harassment and things like that. Yeah. Um, but others are looking at that. I'm just not up to date on that. Well, but okay. I think Thanks. what, what you're reading is be I, sensitive to these things. Yep. Can I follow up with my question? Absolutely. Yeah, so I was just going to say, so in that context, if you are in your closet, if you are in your garage, if you have to be in your bedroom, do you start the Zoom meeting explaining it and kind of saying, hey, I have to be here? Or is it better to just kind of trust that people will know it's professional or like create, use a Zoom background? Like what's the best way if you have to be in your closet to approach? Um, it's the Zoom background or take a bed sheet and put it behind you and just have a, okay. yeah. And right, and, and, and I wanna also make a plug here, right? Myself, I, yes, I'm a professor now. Yes, I had a great 
uh, education, but I do come from a lower income neighborhood, right? And for a lot of kids, getting to put up a background is also about creating a virtual space that feels equitable, right? It means, uh, yes, I have siblings and parents working and I don't have a desk, right? I'm in a small house and I put up a Zoom background and you don't have to know what my home life looks like. Mm -hmm. So I think in general, it can also be, what do you want to present? But it might also give the other people a chance to cover, right? What others wouldn't know otherwise. Um, Good point. So uh, there's also a comment here. We're gonna start to transition Gary and Judy to getting back to some in-person meetings. Uh, and we're all going to have various degrees of comfort with that, right? Some colleagues might be over a certain age. They might have uh, underlying conditions. They might have, right? And they're going to say, you know what? I'm not ready. What do you recommend as we sw switch from one modality, all virtual, and edge back, uh, given individual concerns? I think the most fears. important thing for people to do is be honest, to speak up. Uh, that you're not ready to do that and just go, keep doing the, the Zoom. Um, so it can be mixed modality. A lot of conference rooms have big screens in front. Um, and so those who are at, want to stay remote should. You don't want a frightened person at work. Good. Somebody who right. just avoids everybody and, you know, it's yeah, and red. And these, so. these hybrid situations that I described, you know, a mixture of some people who are co-located and some people who are remote, um, we're, we're learning a lot more about how to manage those kinds of situations. I, I was on an ACM task force just recently that put together a uh, report on how to move conventions to a virtual setting. Since a lot of ACM and other conferences are being canceled and people are considering doing at least part of them virtual. But a question has also come up about doing a conference hybrid in a hybrid session. We have a whole section in this report on what we know about running hybrid meetings. If you're interested in that, Whole report you can see get it it's actually featured on the top level of the ACM uh, website um, so I think you know the, the these hybrid situations can be ones where we can take account of these kinds of transitional situations mm -hmm. good so uh, we're gonna get close to wrapping up but I have a question that I hope is not offensive but is there a fatigue that can come from and it's rooted in Pooja's question can you zoom too much? Can you be in front of your computer too much? And what is the optimal amount that is appropriate to ask your team or your whoever it might be to say? I'll answer this one. Right. Um, what's the is there is there a perfect optimal? Well, you don't want to be zoom all day, but part of the reason is not zoom; it's the chair you're sitting on, <laughs> and the fact that you haven't stood up for two hours. So I have the little reminder on my watch saying stand up, and I can't in the middle of a meeting. But then I have one back to back and I, you know, any meeting gives me another 15 minutes afterwards, I'm going for a walk. All right. So part of it's the ergonomics of your home setting is you are, you know, cranky because your muscles are all tight. Mm -hmm. now, I think it's also where we have to pay attention a lot more when we're doing Zoom about, you know, is the technology right? I, can I hear? Oh, I forgot to unmute. And uh, there's a level of tension just with that. And that's fatiguing. So uh, I think the limits are uh, unknown, but they're personal. Uh, you should do everything you can to move um, and maybe even take the meeting standing up. Mm -hmm. Well, one okay. of the things we did in our, in our ACM report about virtualization of conferences is, you know, a standard conference is it runs all day for like three or four days. Now, spending four days in a row on Zoom, uh, taking into uh, taking in, you know, participating in the CHI conference would be just way too much. And so one of the things we've recommended is if you're doing a virtual conference, you don't have to do it, you know, eight hours for three days. You can do it two hours for eight days. Uh, ways of kind, of kind of repackaging it so that you can make things work a little bit more smoothly. I love that. And you're also, in our other conversations, Gary, you've said, right, in preparation for the meeting, the question is, is this essential? Yeah. Do, I need to, do I need to schedule a virtual meeting or is this fine in an email? or yeah. a, a quick phone call or something, right? So recognizing that fatigue is happening. Uh, uh, real quick, so we have um, a couple more questions coming in. Uh, some, if you make any comments on kids, and, and you, you guys said you have grandchildren, right? They're probably Zooming for instruction right now and mm -hmm. online for learning. We have yeah. uh, an entire university doing 
what do you, th and I know you're not school of education scholars, but any thoughts on its effects? So um, our daughter is a middle school teacher. Um, and so she's teaching online and then having check-in times for her children, et cetera. And in the course of doing that, she's rethinking what, how she wants to package the instruction. So I think when teachers go back to being face-to-face -face in classrooms, they're going to re, they've got some more material now that they've already provided in uh, the, this time. And uh, they're rethinking what's best for the children and the, and the thing she's doing mainly is uh, not teaching all the same things to the, the kids. Um, you know, looking at which ones are having trouble, which ones want to move on, and she's, you know, helping them out that way. And that can go back to the classroom as well. So I think there's going to be a lot of new ideas. That because people have been forced to do this, they're going to uh, take it back to their regular work. Yeah, that was a part of the question that I was asking. Um, it just felt that with there's so many um, online portals for kids and my kids are, you know, kind of younger in age. Uh, so they don't really have the requirements I, and I haven't had to deal with middle schoolers, but there's so many different applications there were so many different websites and it is just a fatigue and you're kind of and you have to learn all this technology because this whole time you've been told not to be on technology, especially for young kids. And now all of a sudden it's like be on technology all day, all the time. And for me, for example, even though I have a computer science degree and we have multiple platforms, it was just too hard to keep track of what he has to turn in and what he doesn't have to turn in and what's just something you have to read and know. And I kind of had to just talk to the teacher and be like, hey, you know, if he's not falling behind. I'm just going to have him write the stuff and then we just do office hours and the teachers are doing office hours, which kind of helped have that one on one connection. But Excellent. yeah, I just had to pull a lot of devices because it was just a lot of fatigue, yeah. Yeah. overload and exactly. management. So Yeah, no, it's I think, you know, some of the chat conversation and I, I'm going to be really respectful of time here as we're winding down. Um, in some ways, um, the even our own UCI students, right? They're saying, wait, I wanted a certain kind of experience and that experience is now changing. And what I love about Judy and Gary's perspective is it doesn't mean better or worse. It means this modality has some real benefits and let me highlight what those are, of which one you just said, individualized education, the ability to connect, to create a private space, but it has its cost, right? Obviously we all believe that our youth should have socialization whether it's from kindergarten to a freshman in college, right, of socialization to different spaces. And some of that we, get, we lose, right, in, face to, in Zoom conversations. But um, any thoughts, are you, any additional thoughts, Gary and Judy, on the function of instruction and pedagogy and what might be glimmers of light, I guess, that can come from technology? Well, I noted that uh, at the school Laurel teaches at, I, if everybody's at home doing all this stuff, not everybody has a computer. So the school gave everybody an iPad and that uh, is going to change how they do their work in school now as well as at home. Um, so I think there's gonna be, the hope is that the teachers talk to each other about how they solve problems and how, what creative ideas they came up with. Um, there's going to be a billion really amazing things that teachers did that they can then transfer back to the classroom. I'm excited about the going back because of the teachers talking to each other. Well, and I think, you know, the whole idea that you can package things differently. I mean, I know people who've been, we, we have not been doing any teaching during this time ourselves, but we've been talking with people who have been. And I know some people who, you know, they recorded some of their material and then the students can look at it at their leisure. And then they'll use these real-time things for you know, discussion and Q&A and stuff like that. So some of the formal pedagogy is packaged differently. It's, it's a little bit like the, the flipped classroom idea where you have you know, the, the didactic material, you can get, get, get to it on your own time and uh, then use the synchronous time for different purposes. So I think, I think this idea that you can package instruction differently, uh, a lot of people who've been experimenting with that kind of stuff in this era are going to you know, take some of that forward yep. in, I think, some productive ways. Good. So um, the last question here, right? So uh, the work on generation suggests that uh, 
certain conditions when you're born change your experiences, right? Whether you were, you grew up in a depression, whether you grew up under time of economic prosperity. And um, this COVID-19 experience could have a very strong imprint on those entering in the work, into the workplace and starting to collaborate. As visionaries, as scholars, what do you imagine might be the Gen Z Ex, you know, experience. Wow. That's and the long-term implications. Yeah, we can thank so Laura like, for the question. Like our, our, I think it's Laura, our, or maybe, uh, yeah. In our case, both of our Anthony grew up during the Depression, and it colored their lives forever, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, 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 their values and their way of thinking about things was just changed fundamentally. Well, for example, children right now are probably learning uh, not to overdo anything. Don't take two Kleenexes when one will do. There's discussions about how many squares and toilet paper you can do. So they're being, learning to be more frugal right yeah. now because they have to be. Yeah. And that's, that's right. That's, that's right. My, a girlfriend of mine was saying that she had went to drop off something at a sister's house and her two-year-old niece came running out of the door auntie, auntie, right? And there was this moment where mom and sister are looking at each other going, do I hug your child? Do I tell them to stop? Yeah. Right? And so, but, but even when we think about how we prepare the workforce, right? I'm asking when we think about somebody day one, maybe they start March of 2021. What do you think they're going to need to essential tools to collaborate under these circumstances? Well, they're going to be used to doing this. And so I think they will have creative ways to continue doing this. Yeah. Um, and so actually having more people come in on a particular problem or issue because they're, they, even though they're long distance, they can keep up with what, you know, how you're building something, for example. And so I think um, making a transition where you actually do this kind of stuff early and then you find out what you can do face to face or what the advantages of face to face. But I also think it's important for them, for the office to talk about this, about what their experiences were and what was hard for them and what did they, either what did they miss from earlier or what did they learn during their time. I think it's important because people have very different experiences. Yeah. Somebody who's lost a, a family member is going to be very different than than Gary and me being this sheltered, safe place the whole time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Any thoughts on my very uh, on what the Bren School can do during this critical time to distinguish itself in service uh, for employees, workers, next generation yeah. uh, well, alumni? To spread the word and be a helpful um, tech person. I'm actually S spread a spread the best practices. Yes. Yes. Is that what you're suggesting? Be a dissemination well, mechanism, okay? And, and also make sure people are aware of what, what services are out there. I know, um, you know, we'll highlight um, things family with mental health or other kinds of or economic of issues. Resources and so out there. Yeah. there are a lot of a lot of things out there that people don't necessarily know about. So I just make sure those are highlighted and and people are aware of them. Excellent. Um, well, I would like to thank everyone here. Um, we have stayed at almost 65 people for longer than the average uh, yeah. lunch and learn. Um, Gary and Judy, after a lifetime of studying this, anything else you would like to leave your audience today? We don't know everything yet. So, <laughs> so, so for those of you who would like to continue this, this, this saga, there's a lot yeah. more to learn about all of this. Yeah. Take notes of everything that's happening. <laughs> You mean, you mean gather data and write the next series of papers and reports, right? Okay, now, um, oops, if I could um, ask, oops, Pooja's sharing her screen here. Um, I wanna thank everybody uh, for attending. I want to wish everybody well, please stay safe, stay healthy. And I want you to be stimulated by this body of research and think what other kinds of scholarship could we do to help um, continue this conversation and this stream of research. Pooja, thank you very much for inviting us. Um, Gary and Judy, if others have follow-up questions, is it okay if they email you? Oh, yes, sure. absolutely. absolutely. Okay, so feel free to connect with them and everyone have a wonderful Friday. Not that it's that much different than the other days of the week, <laughs> but um, enjoy your rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again, everyone, for Bye. joining.
join us every Friday for new topics. And this has been recorded, so it will be rebroadcast on our YouTube channel. And see you guys all next week. Please like, share, and follow us on social media. And please invite other alumni. Thank you again, Gary and Judy. And thank you, Maritza. Of course. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.